Hello there, uh, Grace family, and maybe some guests as yeah. well. Uh, Adam Spees here with Dan Gregory, our campus pastor. And we've been in a series, Sermon of the Mount, and uh, it's gonna be a few months, right? Yeah, it's gonna be a few months. <laughs> um, but as we film this, this is early March, yep. and we're looking forward, enjoying a little warmer weather, uh, looking yeah. forward to Easter around the corner. What, for the Gregory family, what's kind of a, a favorite springtime activity? Well, uh, one, I'm hoping it doesn't snow on Easter. <laughs> yeah. How's that? I, so I don't know if this is Gregory family, but my wife and I both love working in the yard. Mm -hmm. we're, I, yeah. I, I love mowing and mulching and flowers and all that kind of stuff. So my wife and I are probably looking forward to that, just being out in the yard. Yeah. What about the Spies clan? What do you guys <laughs> look forward to? Hopefully some hikes and just enjoying weather. We have a new basketball hoop out, so we've had a lot of games oh, recently, wow. which has been a lot of fun. Can your yeah. kids beat you yet? Uh, they can. We'll see maybe <laughs> some allowance in that, but it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> You'll get to a point where you can't beat them. I just trust me on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. What can we tell them just about um, how we celebrate Easter here, Good Friday, Easter? Yeah, I'd love for, for you to come. If you don't have plans, Easter yeah. weekend. We have uh, three Good Friday services yeah. where we just focus on the cross. We celebrate the bread and the cup together. And so I'd love for you to come be a part of that with us uh, just to focus our thoughts on Jesus. And then Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have regularly scheduled times, 8, 9.30, and 11, and then 5.30. And if you don't have a church home or you don't have a place you're planning to go, we'd love to meet you. We'd love for you to come and be with us. And if you do come, I'd love for you to hit us in the arm or come and talk to us and introduce yourself. But we'd love to invite you to come be with us. Yeah, we hope you'll join us. And we're kind of in the middle of a conversation that's going to take us a few months. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, 20 minutes to preach. It takes us a couple months. Yeah. A, a few <laughs> months, right? And... Uh, his most extensive teaching that we have recorded over the course of three chapters. And we have covered kind of happy are those who are desperate, right? Yeah. Uh, you led us in a conversation of those who follow Christ are called to be salt and light, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've kind of moved into where Jesus is interpreting the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see this conversation so instructional, but also instrumental. Why is the Sermon on the Mount just a, a powerful section of scripture? Yeah, you know, I think, I mean, I could go off quite a while on this. I, I think the reason it's powerful is because several things. I think Jesus is showing us a better vision for mm -hmm. life. Uh, so what you let us in actually last week is this, he, he asked for this greater righteousness mm -hmm. that can only be found in a blessed desperation. Oh. I need the righteousness of Christ. Mm -hmm. I can't attain that on my own. I need him to save me. But I think the power of it too is also, it reminds us of our, our we called it a blessed dependence. Mm -hmm. That the Christian life isn't about, I'm gonna grit it out, try harder, but it's about abiding with him and yep. him producing fruit. And so when I read this, he, we're going to see today, pushes mm -hmm. us into a deeper understanding and application wow. that can only, I think, be realized and understood as we abide with him, as we come to him in blessed desperation, in a dependence. So uh, it is, a, I think, a powerful passage because it speaks to things that are right now, yep. real. And I believe, Adam, and then we'll dig in, you know, there's a, we mentioned in the last uh, weeks or in the sermon I, I'm doing this week, mm. but the book of Proverbs says where there's no revelation, the people perish. Wow. And I think Jesus has a lot of things to say about things that we're struggling with in our society that would invite us into something beautiful and something where he wants to produce fruit and a better vision for our lives. So that's, that's why I think it's, it's an awesome passage of scripture. It is. Yeah. And in chapter five, we're going to be in the end here, he gives kind of six examples, present day reality, and today is probably one that a lot of us have experienced. Mm -hmm. And he kind of jumps right in, in in two verses. And I'd like to read it and then we'll kind of flesh it out. Yeah. But That's Matthew good. 5, 31 and 32, he's talking about divorce, right? A very mm -hmm. sensitive, understandable topic. He mm -hmm. says, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality 
makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Hmm. Right? This section, he always says, it has been said, Mm -hmm. right? Help us understand kind of the context, the environment to which Jesus is speaking these words. Yeah, great question. I think to understand, first of all, if I could just piggyback on what you're saying, like I realize we're talking to people that uh, have been impacted in some way. Some of you have gone through a divorce, been through divorce, uh, grew up divorced, have friends that are divorced. And so uh, I think we want to walk through this with with grace and yet say, what's what's Jesus teaching here? And I think the context of this, uh, it's important to understand is he's quoting Old Testament, right, stuff, Mm -hmm. that there are very significant things in the Old Testament that uh, would have been spoken particularly about adultery, like adultery would have been uh, punishable by a drastic measure, right? And so when he's talking about this, it's like their ears would have perked up. But I think the important context for this is that he's quoting I believe, from a uh, kind of an obscure Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy 14, okay. where, where actually Moses is talking to the children of Israel about divorce. And uh, it can be read and be misunderstood, but he says that this idea of divorce can um, happen, he gave permission for it to happen when there was something displeasing or indecent. Okay? Wow. And I think what happened in the days of Jesus is there were two camps. Hmm. Uh, that were very polarized and it was very combustible. And so Jesus isn't speaking this into a vacuum, just saying, hey, these two camps, one would have been a very conservative rabbi. Uh, I think I got his name right as Shammai. He would have said that what Moses was saying then was you can only uh, give a certificate of divorce when there's adultery, sexual okay. immorality. That's what he, he says, very specific. Mm. There's this other dude, and I'm, I think I'm going to try his name, it's Halal. Mm. He was more on the liberal side. Okay. Yeah. And so what he would have said, and you can see this written out in the mission in all kinds of places, but he would have said that this indecency or this displeasure could have been your wife like burning your toast. <laughs> you know? It's like it's like crazy, right? Any and all reasons. Any and all. Like you find somebody that's hotter, you, you know, don't like this, you wow. don't like that, and you can divorce. So when, when they ask this in Matthew 5, or when they're talking about this, these two polarizing camps would have been very much at play. Wow. Uh, and so when Jesus is, is speaking to this, uh, he would have been speaking into a very fractured, there would have been a lot of, fr- now, I, I, I have read, you know, I didn't live then, that obviously Hillel had a bigger following. Oh, the sure. more liberal idea, right? Yeah. If you're a guy, like, well, man, you know. But I think to understand what Jesus is saying here, there's another passage hmm. that maybe explains it fuller, uh, where Jesus talks about this again, and he's actually being tested. They're trying to back him into a corner in this debate, wow. this Shammai Hillel debate. It's in Matthew, I don't know if you want to look at it, Matthew 19 sure. is, is where that's at. And maybe we just read that and make some observation and then talk about some real practical things. Yeah. So starting in verse 1, it says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee, went into the region of Judea, to the other side of the Jordan. Jordan, large crowds followed him, healed him. Some Pharisees came to him. That's what you're saying. They like the trap test. And they said, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So that would have been one of the camps. That would have been one of the camps. Right. So they're just testing him, trying to back him in a corner. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, where do you stand? This is his response, right, in verse 4. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, he's quoting here from Genesis, right, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Yeah, so a lot lot of things fascinating in there to me. Uh, that I think is important in this conversation. Uh, first of all, I love that he says, haven't you read to these guys, right? These guys are known as the guys who know the Bible inside and out. And he's like, haven't you read? Like, But Jesus, when he's referring to marriage, he, he goes clear back mm-hmm. to the beginning. And he doesn't, do you notice this? He doesn't really answer their question on divorce. He true. points them to marriage. Mm-hmm. And I think people want to have a conversation about divorce without having a conversation wow. about marriage. Yeah. And I don't think you can have the two. Yeah. 
Uh, so I refer to this in the last sermon where there is no revelation that people perish. God says things about marriage mm-hmm. that I think are important for us to get a hold of. He created it. He thought it up. Uh, and so I think Jesus begins there. And I think what he wants us to know is, first, that the, the idea of marriage is rooted in creation. Mm-hmm. Like God gave us the template, so to speak, right, in creation, right? And this idea of marriage is that God took a man and a woman and brought them together in a covenant relationship. Mm-hmm. Different than a consumer, right? You go to yeah. Walmart, you're the consumer. They don't have what you want, you go to Target, sure. right? You're like, whatever. Like yeah. in, right? But, but in a covenant, it's a promise, so I promise with my wife that I'm gonna uh, that, that I'm gonna say yes to you, no to all others. I promise that I'm gonna be there, whether it's good, bad, and different. I promise. So what he says is right at the beginning, they're gonna leave mother and father, be glued mm. covenant to their wife, mm. and the two become one. Wow. Right. And so uh, w- when you understand marriage, it's this joining together. Not, that's not just sexually, by the way. That that's of lives. That, that you're weaving the fabric of two lives together. So when you begin to understand, one, that when the Bible talks about marriage, Jesus roots it in creation. Mm. Now, I would go a step further and say, you read, go to the book of Ephesians. Marriage, to understand it, is rooted in creation, and it's redeemed at the cross. Wow. And so marriage becomes this beautiful picture mm. of the gospel. And and I would even say, uh, Timothy Keller in a book he wrote says, it's not just the picture of the gospel, but it is powered by the gospel. And and so when I begin to understand that, marriage looks different to me. Because marriage isn't just about consumer. Mm. You know, am I getting what I want? Am I happy? Did I fall in love, out of love? All those things we say, right? Mm -hmm. So I love that Jesus starts there, right? Because he starts with saying, you want to talk about divorce, I need to point you back to, to marriage because wow. if we don't get that right, we're going to get this wrong, right? Yep. And so I would say, say this. Can I just do a little advertisement? Mm-hmm. Like some of you may be watching this thinking about getting married, right? And I would suggest this. Like if you're thinking about getting married, I, I say go seek some premarital counseling. Yep. Marriage is a big decision. It is a big decision. Big decision. And it's an important decision, and it's a wonderful decision. Some of you have a bad view of marriage, I would say, I would double dog dare you to talk to somebody who has this uh, long standing commitment, covenant relationship with their spouse in following Jesus and he, let them talk to you about marriage. Maybe you, all you've ever seen is a bad yeah. picture. I like that Jesus didn't answer the question, went right back to marriage. Yes. And he said, if you want to understand divorce, now, now you can begin to frame the question. Yep. Because now you understand, well, if that's his ideal, and he created it, it also helps me understand why the book of Malachi says he hates divorce. Mm. Because he loves marriage. Yeah. He doesn't hate people who are divorced. That, that's a misunderstanding. Big distinction. Big distinction. But he loves marriage. And his ideal and his design for marriage is that a man and a woman together, covenant relationship, mm. where they can enjoy uh, intimacy because of the security of that promise. So, so that's so that's what I think Jesus does here in in this passage, uh, and I think it's that covenant that that drives the picture of marriage, and I think it's against that backdrop that we can talk about divorce. Does that yep. make sense? It does. Yeah. There's this freedom and security designed with this in this covenant to be known and loved and accepted, and yet Jesus isn't afraid to deal with what is real, right? Mm -hmm. He paints Mm -hmm. the picture of his ideal, but he Mm -hmm. also seems to address what's real. Mm -hmm. And it seems here in 32 that he's Mm -hmm. kind of talking about the reality that maybe some of us face. Mm -hmm. He says, but I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. Um, Help us understand what what's he teaching here in terms of maybe concessions or circumstance that Mm -hmm. may have some allowance for divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, so let me start by saying really, really smart Bible people are all over the place, but there are certain things that are specific here. So, so first of all, we can say this, that against the backdrop of God's picture of marriage, which, um, is a beautiful picture rooted in creation, redeemed at the cross. Uh, 
that there are certain concessions. Bef before I get to the concessions, I would say this, that it's that covenant relationship and the fact that my marriage is an expression of the gospel that keeps me in my relationship. Mm. Okay, So marriage isn't, I don't think, ever supposed to be completely easy because sometimes uh, the expression of the gospel that I find in my marriage is something that drives me further into Jesus. Mm. Okay, But what Jesus seems to be saying here is there are times. And, and I would say this, several things I would say, Adam. First is this, before I get to the concessions, I think his picture about two becoming one flesh tells me that divorce should never be an easy option, should never be a first response, mm. should always be a last resort. Timothy Keller, in a book that I already quoted, uh, called it a spiritual amputation. It's an amputation. Wow. That if two, two become one, that divorce is like an amputation. Like, I'm not just taking off my mm. shirt, I'm taking off my arm. Yep. That's what he's saying. And so, I wouldn't go to the doctor with a, with a, a problem with my arm, and his first answer would be, let's cut it off. Sure. Right. Yeah. And so, I, I think the, the first thing is I realize, okay, Jesus is, is, is giving these uh, exceptions. The other thing I would say is this. Nowhere does God command it. So mm. yeah, w w what actually they were testing in Matthew 19, they said, uh, didn't, he, didn't Moses command this? And Jesus is like, no, he permitted it. Big difference. Big difference. Big difference. And the reason he permitted it, because your hearts were hard. Mm. So I want to make sure my heart isn't hard as I pursue this. Mm -hmm. So amputation. I want to make sure my heart is soft. Am I listening to God? I have a humble, contract, all those things as I walk through these things. With that in mind, Jesus seems to point to there, there, there are some exceptions. One that he, that he says, yeah. uh, sexual immorality. There's this adultery that takes place. And um, he's saying in that case, uh, it seems to be an exception where there's permission mm -hmm. for that. Um, if I could say this, I have worked with couples where there's been adultery and God has healed their relationship. Yep. So I think it's important mm -hmm. to say that. It's mm -hmm. a last resort. Absolutely. And, and, and I have some couples, not all, but some couples that have made that trek. That's a beautiful thing because it's a picture of the gospel. For sure. The gospel takes messes, makes them beautiful. Yeah. And so I've seen that. So he seems to be saying that that is an exception. To, to this this idea of divorce. Last resort, not first response. Uh, but you can ask a lot, was that the only one? Yeah, often. Yeah. And, and I would say, no, that's an exception to this because I think he's referring to a specific thing. I think the, the context that he's in, uh, I think the Hillel Shammai debate, but we know it's it's not because we know the rest of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So like 1 Corinthians 7, and you guys could look this up, but... Adam, it talks about if, let's say uh, two people get married, one of them becomes a believer, the other's not a believer. Well, what it says in 1 Corinthians 7, to the believer, to the follower of Jesus, stay together. If they're willing, yeah. Because you can have a powerful, sanctifying impact. Mm -hmm. Show them Jesus. But if this person, and I've actually seen this happen, says, I want nothing to do with this. I want nothing to do with you. I'm out. It says, let them go. Just let them go, and, and I think the passage says we're called to live at peace. Yeah. And you're not, and it literally says you're not bound. So, so we know this isn't the only because First Corinthians seven, and then it leads to other things that I think just need some uh, careful counseling and the community of believers to speak into. Like there, there are some of you listening to this. I don't know who else listening to this. Mm -hmm. That you, you might be in an awful situation where there's abuse. Uh, things where you're being hurt. And I would just say, get out of danger yep. first. Uh, and I, I would say, look, uh, don't try to ally build and don't do anything too quickly, but get out of danger mm -hmm. right now. And, and, and then seek godly counsel that can apply the wisdom of God's word and, and, the, and what Jesus is teaching here, what Paul teaches, and the community of believers uh, who can help navigate that with you. Um, as you walk that, there are some cases where married couples need a redemptive separation. Hmm. And we've seen that, right? You yep. and I've seen that. Yep. Where they separate for a time with a predetermined, this is what we're going to agree on, the pathway, so there's a redemptive reconciliation. 
so that we can come back together in a way that points to Jesus. Uh, so Jesus seems to be saying, last resort, spiritual amputation, there are these exceptions. And, uh, you know, I wonder to myself if the reason he says that you're going to cause her to commit adultery is because in the Old Testament, this thing would have been punishable by death, right? And so, so that person would have been dead. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I wonder that. But that seems to be an exception. Paul seems to say, unbeliever wants to get, that's an exception. Uh, I would say there are times when amputation is necessary for the yeah. body to live. Gangrene sets in. Hmm. And, and so that, for me, becomes a, an overriding principle to help guide the conversation yeah it's a great question and i think <clears throat> like that um some people that maybe are are walking through a divorce maybe have seen others even if maybe a view of marriage isn't a covenant marriage they experience the pain of divorce mm -hmm. right on some mm -hmm. level what would you say in terms of maybe someone walking through it uh in terms of how to best heal what resources do we have as a church to mm -hmm. kind of help walk alongside and encourage those who might be experiencing that pain. Yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, I mean, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I just don't think we're meant to do this thing alone. Hmm. And so uh, you're going to be tempted to go to isolation. It's not going to help. Uh, you also are going to be tempted to ally build. So maybe your spouse, former spouse, has done some really wrong things and you're going to be tempted to want to put yourself in situations where it just feeds and fuels your fire. It's not going to help. Uh, I think you need to be in a community where you can say, what does it mean for me to drive into Jesus on this? Uh, one of the things that we have here is something called divorce care. Mm -hmm. It meets on Sunday evenings. And if you're somebody who's walking through that, I want you to know several things. God loves you. We love you. And we want to be helpful yep. to you. And so we have some wonderful people that lead that, walk people through that. And we would encourage you to, to let us know if you're interested in that. We'd love to connect you with those folks. Yeah. Yeah, I think what you said, don't do it alone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're watching this and we can be of any help, we'd love to meet with you, pray with you, kind of help connect you uh, best mm -hmm. that we can because... Uh, we recognize that that is a hard path that um, a lot of people are impacted and affected. And so uh, we just want to be brothers and sisters in Christ as an encouragement through yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, we love you guys and, and want to be helpful in that. Some of you that are married, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Let let Jesus rub into you whatever he wants to rub into you, out of you whatever he wants to rub out of you. And I would even say to you, there comes a time when you raise your hand and don't do it alone. You're like, I need some help. We need some help. Uh, it, it, because what we want is for our marriage to be this powerful picture of the gospel. And sometimes you get to places in your marriage that you wouldn't have gotten unless you'd walked through some hard stuff well, together. Yeah. So. Well, thanks for navigating uh, this kind of conversation. We hope that you'll join us throughout the rest of the conversation, Sermon on the Mount Sundays and some, some of these extras that we may have throughout. And uh, we hope to see, connect with you Easter. I hope so too. Hope to meet you on Easter. Have a great day. God bless you.